Hi everyone, welcome to my conversation today with Senator Kelly Ayotte, who I openly admire and I'm thrilled you're here in my home today. Thank well, you for coming. Thank you, Nancy. It's great to be here. I really mean that about openly admiring you. I think you're one of the great senators I've known. I've known a lot of them over my life and I'm always just fascinated with some of the things you're doing. You're on six committees. Is that right now at six? Yes. Or and, um, you know, I really appreciate your saying that, but I, I have to say I admire you for all that you've done for women uh, in making sure that we find a cure for breast cancer and support women. So I admire you for everything that you've done. Well, you've helped us a lot, and we'll try to get to that a little later because I just think what you do is just so interesting. And, you know, uh, you have had a public career, really, since, what, 2004, when you were named Attorney General yes. and, in New and, Hampshire. Yes, and even before that, I, I was a prosecutor, mm -hmm. a murder prosecutor and the Deputy Attorney General, so I've spent a big part of my career uh, serving, and it's been a privilege. So now that you, you're in just full bloom being, being a senator, I mean, you're, you're considered one of the 20 most admired public servants. Every magazine I pick up, you're in there with some wonderful deserved accolade, but how do you feel about being a senator now? What do you think, what would you like to happen for, for other people running for office or women running for office? How, how do you feel about that? Uh, well, first of all, um, for me, being a senator, it's just a privilege to serve. And why I got into this, um, I had been attorney general, but I had been an appointed attorney general from the governor. So um, my first run for elective office was the U.S. Senate. And for me, what motivated me, I've, I'm the mother of two children, so I have um, an eight-year-old Jacob and an 11-year-old Kate. And as I see the country, I really think that if we don't work together to solve our problems now, uh, I don't know what their future is going to hold. And I think that's what all of us want, right? Mm -hmm. A better, brighter future for uh, the next generation, for all of us, but also what are we passing on to our children the next generation? And that's what motivated me to get into office. I think we need to encourage other women uh, to get engaged, to get involved, and to think about running for office. There are so many capable women out there in business, in the medical profession, in the nonprofit sector, already involved in public service in some way. And often they just don't see themselves running for office, and we need to encourage them to do so. I think um, for women, you know, we're, we're all very busy trying to balance often work, family, career, and so we don't always think first, well, how, how will I do this? How will I run for office? And sometimes I like to say this, and, um, you know, my male colleagues, they're great, uh, but I think sometimes, you know, my male colleagues, they, or those that I've known that have men have been in public office, they look in the mirror and they say, I see United States Senator. <laughs> For me, I, I had to have people encourage me and say, you know what, you've had this distinguished uh, career in public service. We see a United States mm -hmm. senator in you. And that's why I think often for women, we have to say, we encourage you. My count, or I probably have old information, was that there were now four Republican women senators, but that may have changed. And we have five. Huh? Five Republican <laughs> women now. Uh, two were elected in 2014, uh, Joni Ernst from Iowa, and also Shelley Moore Capito from West Virginia, and both are uh, the first women to be elected in their states. Yeah, that's one of the big issues that you've become really involved in, is the heroin epidemic. Yes. And not only that, in, in health care, you referred earlier to, to my work in breast cancer, but you've been an enormous help in so many things, and among the committees you serve on, and, and I want to talk a little later about the armed forces, and that is fascinating also, but talk... Talk to me for a minute about the heroin addiction problem in New Hampshire. So this has been devastating. So we have had a record number of drug deaths this year, over 430. And so over a person dying a day in New Hampshire, um, and you know we're a state of 1.3 million people. But what's really struck me, Nancy, is uh, the parents who have come to me, uh, the grandparents, the brothers, the sisters, you know, just, um, just yesterday, I started off my day, and I went to the wake of a 28-year-old yeah. young woman who um, died of a heroin overdose to pay my condolences to the family. Mm. So this is really hitting our state hard. Um, so what I've been working on, uh, about three weeks ago in the Senate, we passed what's called the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. Mm. And it passed 94 to 1. Um, that is a rare moment wow. in the United States wow. Senate. But it's legislation that I worked on for over two years. 
uh, with very bipartisan. In fact, we um, brought together over 100 stakeholder groups from around the country, law enforcement, uh, prevention, treatment, those in social services on the front lines, and it's got a prevention component, treatment, support for our first responders. Uh, this legislation is now, now over in the House, and I'm very hopeful that it'll get passed because the House version has a huge number of co-sponsors, and this is just important. This is about saving lives. It is. And you know, I, I'm older than you are, and I can't remember a heroin addiction problem that I ever heard about that didn't wasn't very very distant. What do you think is it the What do you think seeds this? Now that the heroin's so cheap on our streets, mm. um, this heroin has come over our southern border. It has actually been trafficked up, for example, to to uh, Lowell and Lawrence, and then up to New Hampshire. But it's not just New Hampshire. You've got rural areas like Kentucky. West Virginia, mm -hmm. rural Ohio, Rob Portman's been a great partner on this, mm -hmm. um, that this is really killing so many people in our country. Well, that's you know certainly a, a great effort, and, and thank you on behalf of, of everyone for doing that. It, it's just very, very important work, truly. Um, Too so many families have, have lost someone that they love, and we just, this is one where we gotta turn this around. Yeah before it becomes a huge, or yeah. as it's becoming a huge national right. exactly. epidemic, which is how these things happen. So speaking, though, about keeping people safe and healthy, you've been a fierce advocate for, certainly for the cause that I've worked very hard at, which is breast cancer, curing this disease yes. and, and other women's issues. But I must tell you, one of the most impressive moments I had was when you were busy, you were doing a, an armed services, you were in the middle of a, something very, heavy, and I can't remember what it was, you'll have to excuse me, but we called you that day and said, this bill is not going to pass. It was a breast cancer piece of legislation unless you help us and you stopped and helped us, which I thought was so admirable. And I just want you to know everyone appreciated it so much. Well, I was so glad to do it. I've just really admired your work yeah. and your passion and uh, your focus on saving lives with a cure for breast cancer and also obviously treatment and support for women. and. To me, um, the other issue I've been really passionate about on this front is uh, these new recommendations that have come out by the U.S. Preventative Services. Uh, this is shameful. And I also led the effort to put a moratorium on these recommendations for the next two years so hopefully we can revisit them. And uh, I met this week, Nancy, in New Hampshire with uh, a number of breast cancer survivors they all were diagnosed between the ages of 40 and 50 because they got their annual mammogram. And now we have a government panel saying, oh no, between the ages of 40 and 49, you don't have to get a, an annual mammogram. That's wrong. It wasn't based on good medical science. And I'm gonna continue to push on this issue too because we know early detection is critical. We want a cure, but we obviously need early detection until we have that cure. Right. Well, I for one am extremely, my, you know, my sister died at the age of 36 many years ago. Uh, but she, and she had an unfortunate, n not a good mammogram. Right. I did have a mammogram years later when I developed breast cancer, and I'm very grateful. I was 37 or 38. Wow. And I find that this is often the case that many women have. This is a yes. problem. And, uh, of course, the Susan Komen organization, and I differ just a little bit, even though I'm the founder, and because the science discussion is what is the real risk, at what age is the average risk, and there are many issues involved. At the end of the day, we have to use the best screening tools we have I available. Agree. And it should be between a woman, a woman and her physician I if agree. she has one. I agree. And, and this, this sort of trying to, 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 you know, put everybody in a certain category, and it just doesn't always work that way. That's so true. Because look at when you were diagnosed yeah, with yeah. breast cancer. Yeah, it doesn't. And I, you know, kind of insisted on having a, a screening program. I was in my 30s, given yeah. to me, and thank heavens you, I did. Right. You know, and um, it wasn't definitive, but it showed there was a change. There was something, and I had to, to do something about it. Oh, well, thank God you did. And, you know, I, what, what brought me to this issue is my hairdresser. Um, she has two children. She had uh, breast cancer diagnosed twice um, in really in her 40s, mm -hmm. in her early 40s. Mm -hmm. And so the first one was very aggressive, and it was very slight and wasn't something she noticed on her own just the annual mammogram, and it, had, it was such an aggressive form of cancer, had they not gotten it right away, she wouldn't be with us. Mm -hmm. And you know, here she is, yeah. a mother of two children, and so that, that motivated me. I think we, we wanna make sure that women 
have the ability to uh, know that that early detection is there for them. You may not know it, but Senator Ayotte's husband, Joe, is a veteran, and we're gonna talk about it when we return, as she is a member of the Armed Services Committee of the Senate.